Today we're in New York for another episode of Talking Watches. We'll be speaking with a man who's one of the foremost experts on vintage Rolex in the world. He also happens to be the owner of the Vintage Rolex Forum and is a dealer of vintage Rolex at 10past10.com. He also happens to be a significant private collector. His name is Eric Koo, and today we're Talking Watches. Eric, thanks for being here today. Thank you. Most people know you as a vintage Rolex expert, collector, dealer, connoisseur, man of many trades, but you personally as a collector, you collect much more than just Rolex. I love all watches. I'm happy to be working as a uh, dealer of vintage Rolex, but really I have appreciation of a lot of different brands and styles of watches. So what did you bring here today? I brought a real mixed bag of things, some independents and some vintage watches of other brands besides Rolex. This is one of my more recent acquisitions. It's a Le Coultre Deep Sea Alarm made for the US market. These were launched in 1959, 1960. Very rare. They did a reissue two years ago that was quite successful. I've seen this watch from your collection before and what's so amazing about it is that it is like mint condition. I mean, it looks yeah. like a brand new, it looks like the re-edition. Absolutely. I've seen many examples of this watch and for sure this is the nicest one I've ever seen. The bezels are usually really scuffed up. This one is relatively mint. The dial is really nice and the bracelet is really nice. There's a couple little scratches, but the bead blasting, everything is really fantastic. And this is also box and papers as well. Yeah, box and papers complete. And in the LeCoultre, Diego LeCoultre family, there's another iconic watch. Absolutely. The Reverso, the Reverso is a very special watch. It was launched in 1931 and still retains a lot of its same shape and lines. As you know, also LeCoultre re-released the Reverso 1931, maybe two years ago as well. And I was lucky to acquire this actual 1931 Reverso, which doesn't have papers, but it has the original box. This thing is like a time capsule. It's like unworn, basically. And what's funny is there are a lot of 1931 reversos. This is the actual dial that they remade exactly. in the modern watch. This is really like when somebody says the original reverso, this is the original reverso. And so as you go through the, the lines of, of other iconic watches, Hoyer plays somewhat of a role in that. And you've got sure. arguably kind of the, the Mac Daddy, the big guy of vintage Hoyer. To me, the most iconic one is the Monaco. And I have with me here today a PBD Monaco. They call it the Dark Lord. I love this watch, but because it's so mint, I hesitate to wear it because the earlier applications of PVD are not like today, and it scratches very easily. You could probably scratch this finish with your fingernail. <laughs> so I'm really hesitant to wear it, but I think of it as like a really beautiful piece and really iconic watch. Next to Hoyer, there's always another kind of chronograph brand that gets a lot of love from collectors, and that's Omega. And this is a watch that, that I've mentioned on the site that I particularly love. This is a 2915 yes. Speedmaster, so the very first Speedmaster. Absolutely. These are fantastic watches, historically important, you know, gone to the moon, and um, they're really beautiful, you know? Yeah, I remember one time recently we were talking about these, I think, when I was looking for one, and you said, you know, for similar money to a Paul Newman Daytona, uh, yeah. this is potentially more watch, more interesting, more rare, more yes, everything. I do agree with that. The standard pump pusher Paul Newman is really iconic. The value is tremendous now, and it's yeah. really important to watch, but I think these are much rarer, actually. And, you know, I think they still have a lot of appreciation, value, potential. And especially considering that the movement in this, the Lamania 2310, which is the yeah. base for the 5970, for the yeah. 5070, yeah. for so many other iconic watches. And it's really just a top, top tier movement yeah. in, as you said, a great case, a great dial, great everything. Yeah. Next to the, uh, the Speedmaster is another early Omega. Shares similar design, similar hands even. Yes. And what is this? This is a Railmaster. The reference is 2914. And this is Omega's interpretation of a Milgauss slash Explorer, possibly. It's a time-only watch, you know, with an anti-magnetic movement. And again, going along like Omega being a very important watch brand, this is one of their important iconic sport slash tool models. When I started buying these, you know, I wanted the first series, Seamaster, Speedmaster, and Railmaster, because they're such important and beautiful watches. I'm still looking for that Seamaster, if anybody has one to sell me. So in addition to collecting important vintage watches from, from other people, you also get into high-end independent watchmakers. We're talking yes. Philippe Dufour, uh, Cargo Voltiline and MBNF, things like that. And you actually have an amazing collection of independents that I think a lot of people would, would be surprised by. Yes. Uh, so what is, what is this over here? So when I was in college, 
I first started paying attention to watch brands. And um, one of the designs that really blew my mind was Vianney Halter with the uh, Antigua. It's an automatic perpetual calendar and all the uh, functions are split out into little subdials. This watch is very iconic because I feel like this was one of the important watches that kind of launched this independent watchmaker movement. This is also one of the first things that kind of launched this steampunk movement, you know, with this very Jules Verne inspired look. And kind of a contemporary of the whole steampunk movement would be Max Booster and Friends. Absolutely. BNF. And I know you're a big fan of Max, and yes. this here is his most recent HM. This is the HM5. Yes. And so do you wear this watch driving? Because this is a driver's watch, right? I do. I think this is a really fun thing. It's really big and chunky, but again, it's something that is just really beautiful. And for those of you that have not seen it in person, you really need to see it, touch it, hold it, handle it. The lines are very reminiscent of a 70s muscle car, yep. 70s Lambo Mira. The dial looks like an instrument cluster from a Camaro or something. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's all cool. Speaking of contemporaries of early independence, F.P. Jorn is one man that always is mentioned in that conversation. And you have not an early Jorn, but kind of a special one, and this is the aluminum centigraph. Yes. So this watch weighs less than you could possibly have. Yeah, I don't know the exact measurements, but it's extremely light. The lightness was achieved by the movement also being made out of aluminum. To me, it's like a technical engineering marvel. You know, I was always intrigued by the centigraph because it can measure hundredths of a second and it looks really cool when the chronograph is running. It's just a really fun watch and I really appreciate the technical engineering that went into it. And on the opposite side of the independent design spectrum, two really classical watches from Masters. The first is a Laurent Ferrier. Yes. So who is this guy? What do you like about this guy? He uh, worked at Patek Philippe for a very long time, was head of the research and development team. And I say he's like a renaissance man because he, you know, is very interesting. I think it was 1979. He raced in the 24 hour Le Mans. He podiumed, I yeah, think they, his third. team placed third behind Paul Newman, another uh, legend that's somehow associated with watches. Yeah. And the guy just makes simply beautiful watches. This looks like something that Patek Philippe would have made many years ago. The finishing of the movement is fantastic. The shape of the case is really beautiful. It's a relatively new brand, very small operation, but I really like what they do and I find their finishing is second to none. And on that topic, we come to somebody who's no stranger to the Hodinki uh, crew here. He's the Grandmaster, Philippe Dufour. Yes. And you are one of the lucky few yes. to own a simplicity. So how did you come across this watch? This, again, is a watch that I had known about very early on in my collecting days. And at that time, Mr. Dufour was still taking orders. He hadn't finished the 200 watch run. You know, I was interested, but still I was thinking, man, a time only watch for $50,000 is absolutely crazy. Right. I would never ever own one. Fast forward a few years, the bug caught me again and I started looking for this watch. I was really fortunate that I found an example in the metal and the size that I had wanted on the internet. A deal was quickly made. You know, I was just really happy to be able to acquire it. It's very difficult for some people to understand why the simple time only watch is, you know, coveted by so many people, but once you hold it and see it in the flesh, you really understand. So, you know, all this stuff is what you collect personally, but at the end of the day, you are a Rolex man. Yes. And the watch that you're wearing here is kind of a special Rolex to you. It might not be the most expensive one, Absolutely. but it's the one that matters a lot to you. Yes, yes. In my early days of collecting, this was one of the first nice watches that I found. It's a uh, Submariner reference 6536. This one happens to be a fantastic example with a really bright red triangle, perfect gloss gill dial, original hands, original bracelet. I found this watch in San Jose on eBay. And so because I was relatively local, I had called him and arranged to do a trade with him for a modern Submariner plus $1,000. I was driving down, the traffic was really bad and I was really concerned that somebody would snatch it from me while I was driving down to go see him. Yeah. So as a young person thinking of what I could do, I had my younger brother who was 10 or 12 at the time, just call the guy nonstop. You know, <laughs> like I literally had my brother call him nonstop for 30, 40 minutes until he just stopped answering the phone, which was, <laughs> uh, I feel kind of bad about that, but I really wanted this watch. <laughs> You're in the trade of, of buying and selling watches, essentially, yes. at the end of the day. So what is it about collecting that you like, separate from dealing? 
I think people in general are either born with this collector's gene or not. When I was a little kid, I collected baseball cards, I collected stamps. There's something in a lot of people that likes to just collect things, you know. Watches, I think, are really for men, probably one of the only accessories that we wear. So it tells a lot about individuals' tastes and style. So I think that's why many people find this a really compelling hobby.